so good evening one and all on behalf of the department of english mindapur college once again i welcome you to this online virtual platform to this online lecture series so today amongst us we have uh, apola dash ma'am so before she begins her lecture uh, i would like to introduce our resource persons our speaker today in these few words so apola dash is a phd candidate in english at the university of toronto canada she received her b and ma in english literature from the english and foreign language university hyderabad india her research is in the fields of global modernism critical theory and post colonial translation studies she is particularly interested in the intersections between politics and theology religious traditions in secular modernity and the ways in which such intersections shape non european models of ethics and practices of resistance she is currently working on a dissertation that focuses on how non mainstream forms of modernist aestheticism uh, express themselves through literal formal experiments and other complex and original model modes of political resistance as part of her broader project she is also interested in exploring such links between monastic institutions their political roles and their critical contribution to literary inscriptions and censorship in medieval studies her work has been published and also forthcoming in the journal of western writing the wallace stevens journal and the bloomsbury world review series so uh, that's uh, the few words i have tried to introduce our speaker today and she will be speaking on a global modernism and introduction today so without further ado i would request our resource persons to begin the lecture and this is a note for the audience who are listening to the talk on youtube and facebook both so they can drop their questions in the comment section and at the end of the lecture i will bring them out to our research persons so over to you ma'am okay hello everyone thank you uh, midnapur college and the department of english uh, for organizing these wonderful lectures uh, lectures and for inviting me um, and for the uh, all those who are online thanks for joining in on a sunday evening like this um so i'm going to talk about global modernisms um it is a field uh, which many of you might already know a little bit about um and those of you who are uh, acquainted with modernist literature uh, and the kind of criticism that's going on in modernism right now uh you might have a sense that the field of modernist studies is no longer uh, you know uh, limited to uh you know study uh, studies of um, these uh, white canonical uh euro american or at most transatlantic authors from uh from the early 20th century like t s eliot virginia woolf um ezra pound and so on uh, modernist studies is no longer limited to that it has in a way gone global and so my topic is today for for today is that Uh, i chose this topic not only because this is this is my topic this is my research area but also because i feel like global modernisms is a uh is an area which is not very um not very well known and not not much spoken about uh in academia outside of north america where where i am situated so so i thought this was a very this was a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce um and there is reason for that as i'm going to come to in my come to that point in my talk at some point today um uh, you know there is reason why if you are a student in india uh undergrad or postgrad uh, you you will very you you will have a certain sort of set notion of modernism which if you uh you which wouldn't or in a way that it shouldn't be that that um uh, so anyway without uh without for ado let me uh further ado ado uh let me um uh get straight to the point um uh now one more thing that i wanted to clarify before i begin talking about it is that modernity and modernism uh are phenomena which are not restricted as as we know uh to literary modernism uh 
um, it's uh, it's very difficult to understand modernism if you don't uh, understand literary modernism in the larger context of aesthetic modernism. So you have to understand what is going on in modernism, for instance, in sculpture or in painting or in the visual arts, um, even uh, in dance and performance, uh, music, for instance. So all of these architecture, architecture is a very important um, aspect of modernism, uh, modernist studies. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to let you know, uh, you know, if any of you are interested in exploring Indian modernisms, uh, there is a one of the, one thing that I've noticed in my understanding in my exploration of Indian modernisms is that uh, there's a lot of and this is partly owing to the fact that when we talk about contemporary Indian literature, the field that um, that almost monopolizes um, understanding of contemporary Indian literature is postcolonial studies, and because of postcolonial studies, um, you know, uh, it, it obscures the idea of modernism um, and the modernity and the intersection of modernity and inter modernism to some extent. I mean, I wouldn't say that. Uh, postcolonial critics do not engage with modernism, but postcolonial critics generally have um, a kind of suspicion towards modernism because the idea, the traditional idea in postcolonial studies is that modernism is this uh, almost apolitical or politically non committal um, literary movement that is very um, Western and white and based in um, Europe uh, and in the trans transatlantic scene. So um, which is not true at all. And that's the point of uh, having this discussion on global modernism. Um, what I was talking about earlier is that in order to understand Indian modernism, what I have, uh, like I was educated in India and one of the things that I had no idea studying modernism in India is the interat scene of modernism in India. So I would urge um, you there's this wonderful work on architecture, as I said, dance and performance, music, um, and actually, some of the best work uh, on um, modernism in India has 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 come um, in these areas. Uh, has uh, so um, so I would urge anybody who is interested in Indian modernisms to actually take the interact scene more seriously and not uh, keep yourself uh, restricted to the literary modernist scene. Anyway, so but for my purpose here, for my talk here, I'm not going to. I'm not going to focus on, I'm primarily going to focus on literary modernism, but I'm going to take a little bit of an interact approach, particularly uh, with reference to painting, uh, as you will see. Um, okay, so now let's uh, let's map the field first. Uh, as, I, as I already mentioned, what is modernism? We know of modernism, the way we have been trained to understand modernism is that it's, a, it's the post Victorian phase in English literary history starts roughly in the 1890s, ends around the end of the Second World War, so 1945. We also know the prominent names, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, and some of you might also include Gertrude Stein, William Carlos Williams, Wallace Stevens, Langston Hughes, and several others in this um, list of names. To give you, um, and, and in traditional modernist studies, a more detailed breakdown of this modernist period, um, which is sometimes under, easier for us to, which is sometimes important actually for us to understand. Um, you know, if you if you want to understand how a field has is being expanded or is being dismantled in a way or you know diffused, you have to understand what it was or what uh, what were the core, the basic ideas. So basically, fundamentally, uh, modernism used to be uh, used to be broken down into three phases even within the 1890 to 1945 period. The three periods were 1890 to 1910, which was considered as proto-modernism, 1910 to 1930, which is the very crucial high modernist period. And so you have um, important texts, modernist texts like Tender Buttons coming out uh, in 1914, 1922, you have Ulysses um, and uh, the famous, uh, the, wa the Wasteland, uh, 1923, you have the, uh, Wallace Stevens's Harmonium Poems. 1925, you have Mrs. Dalloway, Virginia Woolf, and so on. So this 1910 to 1930 is the very crucial high modernist period. And 1930 to 1955 is what is considered late modernism. 
and what are the formal techniques and formal attributes or uh, you know um, yeah that that we that we associate with modernism uh, some of the some of the more, most uh, well known ones are for instance stream of consciousness uh, joyce's epiphany uh, the general difficulty of modernism modernism modernist literature is known for its difficult esoteric obscure style um, and modernist literature is very uh, you know it's very uh, unorthodox so um, modernists became modernists by sort of rejecting and eschewing traditional literary forms um, and you know more experimental modernism is more experimental so you have stein's uh, automatic writing and you know things like that uh, uh, as markers almost formal markers of modernism um, and also modernism is extremely ekphrastic. What is ekphrastic? Ekphrastic, ekphrastic is the interact uh, issue that I was talking about. Ekphrasis is the use of um, um, another medium of art or the adoption or appropriation of another, the content of another medium of art into uh, literature. So modernism is extremely ekphrastic that way. Anyway, this is our, this is our basic idea that, that we work with in modernism. Now, what happens to it in the 1960s? In the 1960s, some of the debates originate of global modernism. Um, and I'm going to talk about it. For instance, particularly this critic called um, George, uh, George Lukács. Uh, I'm going to talk about him. But the field starts developing in the late 1980s, uh, particularly in the works of Raymond Williams. Marxist theorists and critics, um, critics Raymond Williams and Frederick Jameson. I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, these uh, critics, you know, um, in more details uh, towards the end of my talk today. But just to give you a general idea, the debates originate in 1960s. Field starts developing late in in the late 1980s. Um, following this, in the 90s, several important associations, for instance, um, the Modernist Studies Association, is uh, formed. Um, and journals were inaugurated for to, to, which diversified modernist studies. So for instance, a very well-known journal, Modernism and Modernity, I think came out in 1995. And since the late 2000s, again, there has been a solidific solidification, almost a sort of formal announcement of this field. And uh, this was done by uh, a very important article published by two noted modernist studies scholars called Douglas Mao and Rebecca Wolkowitz. Um, they wrote an article called New Modernist Studies, which came out in PMLA, which is the Publications of the Modern Language Association in 2008. Mao and Wolkowitz's article formally announced what is called a global or transnational turn in modernist studies. Um, now, this article summarized relevant works in the field that has already that had already gone uh, gone on before them, um, gives us an idea of the canon or archive of global modernism. Uh, they were not doing anything very concrete. They were sort of just simply summarizing um, the tenets of this field and what is new about new modernist studies. Um, and they, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very resourceful article if you want to actually have a bibliography of uh, global modernist uh, scholarship. Uh, what the article also did was it explained the field's relationship with related fields, for instance, with particularly with post-colonial theory and world literature. And I'm going to come to how post-colonial uh, post -colonial studies um, is related to global modernisms in a while. Uh, but let me first talk about the main core argument of uh, Mao and Wolkowitz's article, uh, which is that they talked about three kinds of expansion in the field. And these three kinds of expansion basically, basically, you know, defines global modernism as a field. So the three kinds of expansion are temporal, spatial, and vertical. So temporal is pretty understandable. Um, temporal expansion, as in, you know, as I as I just said, that modernism is understood as this literary period from 1890 to 1945. Whereas if we if we temporally expand it, um, more global modernist scholars. Uh, you know, um, go back at least uh, to the mid 19th century uh, and post 1945. You know, at least in 1960s or 70s, uh, and call call the, this period as modernist uh, as modernist because you know, in order to accommodate the other modernisms in in non Euro American non transatlantic modernisms, often 
these modernisms had phases that were coming either earlier or later. But also some ideas in global modernist studies actually takes, it, takes the whole idea back to several centuries. So for instance, um, the early modern period can be considered as a modernist moment. Um, the 17th century can be considered as a modernist moment. moment um, uh, you know, because of the, the Elizabethan period, for instance, with the Reformation and so on, so religious reformation in Europe. Um, and uh, for instance, the French Revolution can be considered. So, you know, so all of these, uh, so I, this is what this is what the, we basically mean by diverse, uh, sorry, by temporally expanding modernis modernism. So you understand, you, you look at uh, tempor you know, um, uh, moments uh, outside of this 1890 to 1945 um, bound uh, as moments that could be understood as modern. Um, okay, the next uh, expansion uh, comes in the spatial. Uh, it, the next expansion is, is spatial. So, for instance, as I as I've been saying already, you might you might uh, might have guessed uh, by now that uh, modernism no longer remains a Euro-American or trans-Atlantic phenomena. So now we can have modernisms, for instance, in Nic Nicaragua or Nigeria or Mexico City, uh, Caribbean modernism, you know, modernism um, in Shanghai or in Lebanon, in Beirut or Bombay, you know. Um, the third kind of expansion is vertical. What is vertical expansion? Vertical expansion is, um, as I said, the high modernist period is extremely crucial. So high modernism um, has been considered, and it, it's it's quite to, to a large extent actually true that um, high modernists actually were a bit, um, uh, you know, they were they weren't uh, they were very exclusive. They weren't receptive of uh, receptive towards um, forms, uh, literary forms that are, that they they didn't practice. For instance, um, and, th and this this is how high modernism was formed. So so in high with the with the formation of high modernism, as some of you might know, there is a formation of a, a vast divide between what is called high art and popular culture. So high art is extremely difficult you know it needs a particular um, tra training you need a particular tra kind of training as a reader to in order to um uh, in order for you to become this high modernist uh, uh the reader of high modernist art whereas popular culture um it sort of you know belongs to um, the masses and uh, you don't have you need you don't need you know readerly training for it and all, all that now this this divide between high art and popular culture which existed in modernist studies uh, global modernist studies wants to make it disappear so we do not have to have this divide and this is what is called vertical expansion anyway i'm going to go a little fast now because i think uh, i'm going to skip some points and um, and I can take questions later on if you have any, if you need any more clarifications with regards to uh, some of these that I've been talking about. Um, anyway, so I now move on to, and this, so this is this is basically what Mao and Volkowitz's point was. Um, now we, now I move on to clarify the relationship with post-colonial between post-colonialism and global modernisms. Now the relationship, because this is inter it is important to understand. Oh, um, uh, oftentimes the, the the kind of work that goes on in global modernisms comes very becomes very similar, appears very similar to post-colonial studies, but it's really not. Um, there are differences. So, for instance, uh, critics like uh, Jahan Ramazani, very uh, well-known critic in post-colonial studies, um, argues that post-colonial lit is, for instance, more plural and polyphonic than modernism. There are others who have said that no, 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 modernism was, uh, you know, post-colonial studies only exists um, because of modernism, because modernism existed before. Uh, and some people have said that post-colonialism emerges out of the death of modernist studies. Uh, the more, the most. Uh, the critic whose views I found most compelling in this regard is uh, Simon Gikandi, uh, very influential and very important post-colonial uh, post -colonial, post -colonialist critic, um, who basically says what I just said uh, a few moments ago, which is that without modernism, post-colonial literature as we know it today would not uh, perhaps exist. And this is a very bold claim. He, he says he's making a very bold claim. This is, a, this is an article uh, called Modernism in the World. A very short article that he wrote. Um, 
And uh, so he says that we think of modernism as either a political or an aesthetic ideology of fascism, and at least an elite and exclusive aesthetic mov movement. And the fact that post-colonial critics and scholars have been have seen modernism with suspicion and at odds with the political project of decolonization has contributed to this. But we forget that in the early 20th century, the modernists were at the forefront of international struggle against racism and colonialism. So he's talking about, he talks about Nancy, um, Nancy Cunard, uh, Virginia Woolf, and Nella Larson, a transatlantic modernist. Um, uh, but yeah, so Guy Candy's argument, and I think this uh, this kind of frames this this is a very standard and this is a very um, a useful argument to use. Uh, that is that mo in modernist literature, structure and language, uh, a certain post-colonial experience and a certain uh, framework for post-colonial criticism came to be articulated. Modernism's relationship with other cultures was consistent, dynamic, dialectic and constitutive of European and transatlantic modernism. So, um, yeah, now I move uh, directly into uh, talking about some of the main tenets of global modernism. And if time permits, I'm going to go into, um, go into detailed, detailed um, you know, engagement with a few important um, global modernist uh, theoretical formulations. So the main um, issues, for instance, addressed by the global modernist scholars <coughs> were, were finally were uh, were these. So uh, some of the things that I've already mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to uh, go fast with them. And uh, uh, please note down your questions if you have any, and please feel free. Um, uh, yeah. <coughs> so 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 the first the first issue that that global modernist studies addressed was that the the category of modernism should include alternative forms of literature as i said so modernism should not just remain uh modernist literature should not just mean you know difficult euro american early 20th century literature um but for instance one of the uh one of the very almost polar opposite form uh, or style that modernism rejected Modernism, this high modernism of the early 20th century, is as many of you might know, uh, you know, very anti-realist. So the first, the first marker of modernism is that they are anti-realist. What does anti-realist mean? That they do not adopt realistic modes of representation of the world. And um, global modernist scholars are not. Uh, you know, okay with that. So, so in global modernism, we, you know, the expansion of modernism to include other alternative forms of literary literature. Uh, one of the first things that we uh, do is uh, include other alternative forms of uh, forms of writing, uh, including realist writing, because the idea among global modernist scholars uh, is that realism has been traditionally understood as a politically, as a more politically committed and a politically interventionist. Um, form of literature. So some global modernist scholars um, want to include forms of realism. And this also, uh, this also is useful because a lot of the non-Western modernisms that we look at um, are actually realist. And that is, that is one of the reasons why traditional modernist scholars did not think of those literatures as modernist. Um, but uh, if you if you expand the bounds of modernist literature, and include, for instance, uh, realist uh, writings from around the world, uh, and under try to understand them as modernist literature, then that really ex expands, uh, you know, or dismantles the definition of modernism that we have. Um, okay. The other thing is modernism becomes a field as a field becomes more open, uh, open to questions of gender, class, and race. And uh, overall, global modernism challenges the idea that European modernism it challenges the idea, the established idea, that European modernism is prior, original, and central. And that other literatures of the 20th century have borrowed from it, are belated in that sense, and derivative. It focuses on decentering modernism. Now, how does this decentering happen? This decentering happens by introducing other modernities and modernisms, by questioning modernist assumptions about other cultures and traditions. And this is the most important thing, which is I'm going to, which is to which I'm going to come to later on. 
and by examining other sites of production of European modernism. Now, let me, without, um, without explaining these uh, at this point, let me immediately go into giving you concrete examples so that it's easier for you to understand these points. Now, the, one of the ideas, as I said, that the idea that uh, Western modernisms are prior, they are central and they are original, and that they have influenced other modernisms, modernist movements in the world, um, is something that global modernism wants to dismantle. But does it mean that then we don't recognize the influences of Western modernism? No, that, that's not what it means. We do recognize the influences, uh, influences of, global, of European modernism on the rest of the world. But, the, but, but what we do in addition to that is that we understand how these influences were not monodirectional. They were not unidirectional. They were not that you know somebody else in the rest of in another part of the world, a non-European, non-Western part of the world, uh, read Pic or saw Picasso uh, or read Stein and then started writing like them. That's not how uh, we want to look at it. We want to look at it uh, as that yes, there was influence, but all most of in most of the cases as we see that these influences were uh, readopted. You know, um, they were challenged. They were they were appropriated in some sense, and uh, so this is one of the things that we want to look at. The other thing that we wa want to look at is that how these non-Western zones of encounter, the, these these non-Western zones of zones of con contact and encounter, um, actually might have shaped uh, canonical Western modernism as the way we know it. So this is another thing. So these are called alternative routes of modernism, and as you can see, so this is the, this is the kind of interrogation and um, exploration that goes on in global modernism. So let me get give you some examples. Okay, now in terms of influence, for instance, let uh, you know some of the influence, some of the major influences of Western modernism on uh, major you know sites of influence of Western modernism on non-Western uh, on non-Western literary scenes uh, are as follows. The, a very well-known modernist uh, movement in Spanish language uh, literary movement uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century is called Modernismo. They reacted against naturalization in literature and were influenced by the French symbolists. Then we have Arabic modernism. In the 1950s, Beirut, which is the capital of Lebanon and which is where a very shocking tragedy happened um, only a few days ago. Um, so Beirut, it's surprising, not, not many people know about this. Uh, it became the center of Arabic intellectual life in the 1950s. It was connected to other centers like Baghdad, Cairo, um, as well as London, Paris, New York, Berlin. So the other sort of modernist centers. Um, a couple of noted poets called uh, Yusuf Al-Khal and Adunis established a poetry journal called Shair, Shair be, be, uh, meaning poetry in Arabic which was influenced by Harriet Monroe's poetry magazine. Um, if some of you know Harriet Man Monroe, she was a very influential figure in New York, uh, sorry, in Chicago in 1912. And she ran this, uh, she, was a, she was a poetry editor, she was a poet herself, she was a patron um, and a critic. And she ran this magazine called Poetry, called Poetry, which actually launched and introduced several of major modernist poets uh, like Wallace Stevens, William Carlos Williams, Carl Sandburg, Elliot Pound, and HD. So, so Alkhal and Adunis uh, ran this poetry mag kind of a, a magazine called Shire, which was modeled on Harriet Monroe's poetry magazine. So these are very, sort of very direct, concrete influences, as we can see. The other third example is Closer Home. So, for instance, some of you might know um, the. The, one of the main uh, Indian English writers, Mulkaraj Anand. He was, he frequented the Bloomsbury group in London. So the Bloomsbury group uh, was uh, a group of uh, writers and thinkers, left liberals um, in, in London, central London. Um, they met in their homes uh, and sort of informally and uh, two of the most noted uh, of the Bloomsbury uh, group uh, were Virginia Woolf and her husband Leonard, and uh, as some of I mean, as some of you might know, but this is a little less spoken of usually. That uh, Leonard Woolf was in served in the in the cadet uh, 
as a cadet in the Ceylon, in the Ceylon civil service in, in now Sri Lanka. Um, and then he left the, the British you know, administration um, and came, came back home, got married to Virginia, started the Hogarth Press. And um, so he's, he's called uh, some of, uh, by, uh, uh, by some of these global modernist scholars, some often Leonard Wolf is called uh, a reluctant imperialist. Um, you know, so, uh, so as you can say, some of these modernists were actually already resisting and critiquing uh, imperialism at home. Um, and now Mulkraj Anand used to be not, I wouldn't say that he was friends with them because he had, he didn't have very good experiences. He had, he has this really interesting memoir, if uh, some of you want to check it out, called Conversations in Bloomsbury, in which he recounts um, his very private and very idiosyncratic, uh, you know, encounters with people like Eliot, D.H. Lawrence, E.M. Forster, uh, and even uh, Wolf and Leonard Wolf. So, uh, and then as we know that, you know, when Mulkraj Anand writes Untouchable, he's, he's basically lifting up, he's not lifting, uh, lifting up, but he, he's, um, he's, he's using the Joycean uh, form of this, uh, the form of the, you know, one day narrative that Joyce used in Ulysses. Um, he's using the same form in his, in, in his uh, novel Untouchable, which is uh, the novel Untouchable is a one day. So the, t the time frame of the novel is one day in the life of this untouchable boy called Baka. So there are direct influences like that. But um, uh, but let's now move on to see how uh, these and, and these influences mostly uh, were when when these modernists in in non Western scenes actually wanted to resist some of the um, some of the so, some of the issues that they had at home, you know, for instance, the Arabic modernisms, modernists, they wanted to resist. Uh, uh, they were subversive towards Arabic nationalism. Uh, they wanted to separate politics from art, and they wanted to encourage experimentation in poetry. So, so, so in the non, what I'm trying to say is in the non-Western scenes where oftentimes um, political conflicts are more pronounced. Uh, influences of the Western modernists often helped non-Western um, modernists to 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 make to take a stand against the issues that they had at home. Um, so influence is very real, but modernism overall is also has, is being studied multi as a multi-directional and multivalent uh, movement. So now let's move into how. Uh, modernism is not, even though it is influential, it was influential, uh, high modernism, European modernism, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not a one directional flow of uh, influence. So one of the first things is modernism incorporated elements of other cultures in its own formation. And the point of global modernism, therefore, is to question these assumptions, these assimilations, okay? Um, there were transnational circuits for instance, China and modernism. Uh, some of you might know Ezra Pound wrote a lot, and Ezra Pound used a lot of um, Chinese forms of writing, you know, uh, both lithography uh, as well as art aesthetic uh, in, in, in his writing of modernist poetry. Um, and uh, this really important figure called Ernest Fenolosa, who was an Orientalist, an American art historian of Japanese art was quite influential in uh, Japan's during Japan's Meiji era, which is the late 19th and early 20th century era of modernization and rise of imperialism in Japan. Ernest Fenelosa wrote a wrote a piece called "The Chinese Written Character as a Medium for Poetry" in 1920, which by the uh, in, in, which uh, in turn came to Ezra Pound through Fenelosa's wife. Um, and Fe uh, Pound was really influenced by Fenelosa's understanding of the Chinese written character. So what Fenelosa and Pound understood was, or they, they believed, um, is that the Chinese written character um, depicts the con concept that it con conveys. So the idea was that uh, the Chinese written character is as a model, for, could be a model for modernist poetry uh, and this is this is the famous ideogrammatic me method, ideogrammatic method um, that Pound expounds and uses in his own writing. The ideog ideogra ideogram is um, 
uh, a system of representation in which abstract concepts are expressed through concrete images or non-verbal signs and pictures. So this is, a, for instance, a very, um, very important and a very noted, well noted uh, root uh, in of alternative sort of alternative route of influence uh, into modernism. So uh, Pound and Fenelosa's Pound and Fenelosa's modernism was directly influenced by this sort of an understanding of Chinese, uh, the Chinese written character. Uh, but it it has been co it, it, this idea has been controversial. So, for instance, uh, a recent critic called Eric Hayot, a global modernist scholar, he um, he has challenged this idea. He says that while uh, you know uh, the the Chinese written character may have been pictorial in classical Chinese, there is no certainty that um, you know it remains the same and that it it still conveys the, the it sort of depicts the idea that it convey conveys uh, because the Chinese. Uh, character has undergone a lot of changes since classical times, and therefore it's not entirely relevant for modernist writers, the modern modern writers of uh, Chinese. You know that the the, the mo for modern writers of Chinese, the Chinese written character does not necessarily um, function as an ideogram, as a as an as ideogrammatic medium. So. Um, so as you can see that you know these alternative roots of modernisms, uh, the alternative roots of modernism are taken up and challenged and examined, um, and this is the you know this is the main thrust of global modernism. Uh, moving on, the other sort of alternative route of um, influence on modernism has been, for instance, literary education in the colonies. So and this is what I, what I meant in the beginning when I, if you're an Indian, if you're a student in India of English literature. There's a reason why you have very set notions about, say, the periods of Romanticism or Modernism, and that is because of imperial discourse. You know, that is because often uh, a lot of political radical radicalism and a political sort of political changes were going on in the imperial centers, in the metropolitan centers. So in London, there were a lot of um, interesting political and ideological changes going on. But when you, in the colonies. Uh, you know, uh, these changes were not uh, allowed to be, you know, uh, adopted uh, because, you know, then then the imperial centers would lose control over the colonies. So in the colonies, often there was a certain uh, almost antiquated, outdated mode of education, um, which was basically, which, which, which did a lot of things at once. Um, so, for instance, when a Wordsworth is taught in colonial Antigua, or Eliot is taught in post-independence or even pre-independence India, uh, this literature that is high modernist uh, European is considered almost sacred, it's inviolable and inimitable. And this literature, for instance, as the, as the works of several post-colonialist critics like Gauri Vishwanathan and others have shown, that literary education in the colonies becomes a very, influ a very mm, sort of um, you know, important tool uh, to exercise control. So Vishwanathan's book is called Masks of Conquest. And what is the mask? The mask is literary education, that you, you don't want to directly control. You control through ideological um sort of you, you control through ideology and how do you how do you channelize how do you spread ideology through literary education um this is the main idea so often you know these ideas of modernism the idea of mod what modern literature is was found uh, in a more concrete in a more visible in a more intent uh, sorry in a more sort of unchangeable unchallenged way in the colonies in rather than in the metropole um okay the third point is reactions to reactions to western modernism in the margins so often as i said the influence was not very you know like the influence is not unidirectional and the influence is not from a very pa sort of active center to a very passive um periphery and the influence uh, was there but it, it was also very severely challenged um often for instance, um, let us take the very specific and very interesting case of the Bengal School of Art. But what was the Bengal School of Art? It was an art movement that flourished in early 20th century India, and it reflected some of the major political and ideological shifts of the Indian anti-colonial movement, for instance. So, so the Bengal School of Art was spearheaded by uh, 
the nephew of Rabindranath Tagore, Abhinendranath Tagore, who was an Orientalist. And uh, arguably, other uh, painters from this period, for instance, Raja Ravi Varma, Nandalal Bo, Sunayani Devi, um, and Rabindranath Tagore has be, have been thought of um, as belonging to the Bengal School of Art, although this idea is, has been challenged uh, several times. Anyway, so uh, Abhinendranath had a brother called Gaganendranath, uh, who was his older brother. Uh, now, Gaganendranath was, uh, you know, influenced by Cubism, and so he shifted from his older brother's Orientalist uh, mode. Uh, both Rabindranath Tagore and Gaganendranath shifted from Orientalism and moved. Rabindranath did not move towards Cubism; he moved towards a form of Primitivism, as I'm going to come to later on. Uh, after this, actually, uh, now, so, so how is uh, how do we understand Gaganendranath's, uh, and, uh, you know, adoption or influ you know, Gaganendranath being influenced by Cubism? Um, this has been discussed by this noted. Uh, art historian called Partho Meter in her in his book called the Tri Tri uh, called the Triumph of Modernism: India's Artists and the Avant-Garde, 1922 to 1947. Um, Meter attacks English art historian W. G. Archer, who had called Gaganendranath's paintings a cubist monk. A cubist monk means um, a lacking cubist or a missing cubist. So this W. G. Archer was this. And it's it's he's representative of this idea that I, idea of usually of art historians in the metropole in the colonial metropole that all these other sort of you know non colonial uh, non Western uh, painters and artists um, they try to imitate us uh, but they fail so this was the idea about Gaganandas painting and um, Mitter argues against this obviously and he observes that you know so Mitter was one of the first art historians and like in a way global modernists to to point this out that when it uh, when why is it that when we talk about influence from um, from a non western artist the influence of a non western artist on a western artist uh, and i'm going to come to picasso's use of african masks uh, very soon the influence, for instance, was Picasso, as you know, Pablo Picasso, um, noted modernist painter, Cubist painter, actually, uh, was influenced by uh, African traditional sculpture. Now, when Picasso is uh, influenced by African traditional sculpture, that influence is called affinity. It's it's called uh, it's it's seen as something that's very you know um, uh, not as not not as pejorative, not as uh, that does not compromise Picasso's integrity as an artist. Whereas well, that's that's exactly what Mitter is arguing. But what what he's pointing out is that when this influence goes from the, from the Western artist to the non-Western artist. This influence is seen to completely dismantle the artistic integrity of the non-Western artist, and uh, this influence is uh, therefore renders the non-Western artist as something that is derivative, not original, and merely a copy. Um, and he calls it a Picasso monk phenomena, Picasso missing phenomena. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, overall, you know, Mitter argues that. Uh, we need not see. We need not see uh, the late, you know, modernism in late colonial India, uh, modernism in the arts in late colonial, colonial India, as in the Bengal School of Art, as uh, as an influenced modernism. But let us look at it as a paradigm shift. Um, these artists were uh, were influenced not by Western uh, modernists, but by the changing artistic imperatives in the globalizing world. Uh, and that made them so that made them shift from representational art and not uh, something like cubism alone. And uh, what Mitter, this is a very interesting idea that point that Mitter makes and very important idea a point that Mitter makes, uh, which is that influence, when you talk about influence, it makes you think of cultural entities as very individual and discrete. But cultural entities are not in, individual in that sense. They are, there's a lot of mixing and, and a lot of um, shifting and change that is all, uh, always already going on in cultures. So, so when you talk about influence, you, you have to imagine something influencing something, and therefore uh, those things as culturally 
um, discrete and individual, which doesn't, which method is challenging. And then he also says that exchanges do not have to be of dominance and dependence um, and do not have to involve a loss of self. So it could be a sort of more, uh, more friendly exchange or something like that, a more equal exchange, actually. Anyway, so um, now let's come to the idea of primitivism. Uh, and, and the way I would want to segue into the idea of primitivism is through Mitter. So Mitter says that uh, one of the things that he says, he's, he doesn't say that uh, that the influence of Cubism uh, on Gaganandranath is sort of not there. It is there. Uh, and in fact, the avant-garde um, in Calcutta, um, the avant-garde in, in Indian art comes through, uh, after uh, not only as as Mitter has observed, but also other art historians and global modernists, uh, modernists, uh, scholars of Indian modernism observe that the avant-garde reaches uh, India uh, mainly through the 1922 exhibition in Calcutta of the Bauhaus. What was the Bauhaus? Bauhaus was a German art school who combined fine arts, techniques of fine arts um, and craft together to represent ordinary everyday objects, okay? And uh, noted artists like Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, uh, these artists were exhibited in 1922 in Calcutta. And this um, uh, is kind of the beginning of the avant-garde and that's what Mitter is uh, tracing. Uh, but for, uh, but for Mit Mitter, he traces the influence of cubism in Gaganandran's work, and he's tracing this sort of influence of the avant-garde in Cal on Calcutta on Calcutta artists. Um, but then he thinks of uh, this influence as only sort of a prelude, which he actually calls a formalist prelude to a long tradition of art that emerges, which is post-Cubist, out of this. And one of the main figures of that tradition is uh, none other than Rabindranath Tagore. Now, as I earlier mentioned, that Rabindranath shifted away from the Orientalism of Obanindranath and the formalism, you know, in a way, of Gogonindranath towards um, a sort of primitivism. Now, what is primitivism? So, basically, this primitivism is, as many of you might know, Tagore's of Tagore's art, uh, a sort of uh, intention in art to represent indigeneity, to represent the the more um, and the more, uh, you know, the sort of the non-modern or the pre-modern in a way. Um, and this is a very controversial topic. So let me explain that and, um, you know, uh, really sort of clear the ground for that. Uh, uh, primitivism, as I said, is this, the representation of the, of uh, something that is non-urban, non-bourgeois, um, uh, and non-materialist in uh, in art and primitivism w was not just you know uh, what was primarily the, so what I'm trying to say is that primitivism is primarily a sort of a, a modernist phenomena that is seen in both in the Western scene and in the non-Western scene. So in the Western scene, uh, and this is important to in introduce before we talk about Rabindranath's primitivism. In the Western scene, primitivism. Um, is most noted uh, and has been discussed most, you know, in a in the most uh, uh, in a in a most uh, what do you call it uh, detailed and sort of controversial fashion in the works of Pablo Picasso, as I had mentioned. So, what what is Pablo Picasso's primitivism? Um, in so, uh, Picasso had uh, uh, was influenced. Uh, by Africans, traditional African sculpture. And this influence is an instance of a modernist like Picasso, uh, modernist like Picasso's turning away from the materialism of empire. Uh, so as I said, many of the modernists were very critical, even at home, uh, of empire. Um, and Picasso's um, turning towards the African traditional art um, was an instance of, you know, modernists moving away, turning away from empire uh, and turning away from urban, Western bourgeois life, metropolitan urbanity. It was, he also doubted this, this kind of um, aesthetic movement also doubted the unified European subject uh, 
and question the traditional conventions of Western art. So this, in this way, lots of modernists turned to diverse cultural, uh, cultural sort of traditions and incorporated diverse cultural materials into their work. This is a phenomenon which is known as bricolage. And Picasso did the same. Um, Picasso's career had a very distinct uh, period from 1906 to 1909 called the, the African period, where he was influenced by Africa. And so for instance, um, one of the things, one of the uh, things that aided this was that in the early 20th century, the French empire brought African artifacts from sub-Saharan Africa into Paris museums. And that's how, you know, this African, uh, these African artworks uh, were introduced to the modernists. Anyway, coming back to Picasso, there is a very famous painting of Picasso called Le Demoiselle uh, de d'Avignon, the, the, the Young Ladies of Avignon. Uh, in 1907, where there are, you know, it's a picture of, it's a painting of um, five women. The right two, uh, the two women in the right have faces which resemble African masks. Um, now, what is the nature of this incorporation of the African mask? Is it simply very sort of, you know, Picasso was really fascinated and in, influenced by um, African traditional sculpture, or uh, is it something else? Uh, again, coming back to this famous, this well well known uh, post colonialist scholar called Simon Gikandi. Gikandi has a very interesting, very important uh, article called Picasso Africa and the Schemata of Difference in Modernism, Modernity, published in Modernism, Modernity in 2003, in which he uh, tells us a story of this particular Guyanese artist called Aubrey Williams, who was an Afro, Afro modernist and black abstractionist painter. Uh, who met Picasso through Albert Camus. And he, when he, so uh, Williams is, Aubrey Williams is recounting later on. Williams uh, said, I didn't like Picasso. I didn't think, uh, he, uh, he didn't think of me. It's, I felt like he didn't think of me as another artist. Uh, and why he uh, felt that was uh, he recounted this, uh, this experience when Picasso, when he met Picasso, Picasso looked at him and said, um, you have a very fine African head. Could you pose for me? So this made Aubrey Williams, uh, you know, uh, feel that Picasso really did not look at Aubrey Williams as another fellow artist, but only as an African man, uh, as something that he could use in his own work. And this is the main problem with um, Primitivism. So Gikandi argues that primitivism does not mean that the European modernist artist valued the African people, artists, and art, but that he dissociated the art from the African body and abstracted from the art form those elements that could help his struggle against conventions of Western art. Now, this is what happens with primitivism in the um, in the in the Western met, in the West, Western metropole, uh, Western centers of modernism, uh, but uh, but is primitivism nothing? No, primitivists were Western primitivism uh, was not remarkably anti-modern. They were not anti-modernists, but primitivism was Western primitivism was a mode that challenged the teleological certainty of modernity. So the ideas of progressivism and uh, the fact that modernity is the teleological inevitable end of human history, that idea was challenged by primitivists. So there was a turn against bourgeois life, turn against materiality, materialist, um, uh, you know, living um, and so social structures. Um, it was turn against empire in a way. Uh, they were anti-naturalist and anti-urban. So there were merits to that, except that there are political issues there. And these merits are the reasons why primitivism becomes a very important issue in non-Western uh, uh, centers of modernism. And this, uh, this is how we come back to Rabindranath Tagore. Now, what was Rabindranath or somebody like Gandhi's primitivism like? And how is it different from Picasso? So somebody like Mitter argues that Primitivism in the colonial margins was motivated by anti-colonial politics. So what happens in the colonial margins when something like primitivism uh, appears, uh, it, it is primarily, uh, you know, sort of anti-modern, anti-empire, um, 
and uh, if you know uh, if you if you think of gandhian anti modernism and gandhian primitivism we can also think of again think of mulkraj anand's untouchable in which there is a divide between the ethical and the political so the if you remember the last scene of untouchable um, bakha is going back home thinking that you know he he's thinking he's actually seriously thinking about gandhi's philosophy um which is the ethical side of him like the novelist the gandhian philosophy in the novel is trying to trigger the ethics of a dalit subject like bakha but at the same time he's also thinking uh that he has to inquire more about the modern toilet that that indo anglian um person was talking about at the end of the novel so that that the idea of the modern toilet being um being introduced into uh so in, in into a society like bakha and therefore uh of liberating him from his um from his condition uh is a very political idea it has nothing to do with ethics ethics so this contradiction between ethics and politics also becomes a very sharp uh sort of it's it's it becomes a ground for the playing out of primitivism in um because the primitivism in the colonial margin kind of aligns with the ethical um uh, but also and precisely this is why this is why you know on one hand something like some like the shantiniketan school of art uh of rabindranath tagore uh, has a lot of merits this kind of primitivism which is anti materialist um and as uh, as an art historian called r shiva kumar who is a curator of tagore's works has called this contextual modernism which means that um these uh, shantiniketan shantiniketan school of philosophy actually uh, philosophy of art um wanted to be there was an in inclination towards more indigenous forms of art but they understood that to be indigenous you did not have to be historicist or materialist uh and you also did not have to be transnational and sort of a, for, a kind of a formal um artist uh you know and so for more contextual modernism of the kind of tagore's shantiniketan school of that kind of primitivism and this is the merit of the sort of colonial primitivism is that uh, contextual modernism was i quote arshiva kumar critical engagement uh with the foundational aspects of art necessitated necessitated by changes in one's own unique historical position uh so this is a merit, this this was a merit but at the same time i mean you know if you if you think of modernism uh, sorry modernity as from the from the perspective of the subaltern uh and we don't have time to go into that any more today but uh, i would refer uh shudip to kobiraj's article modernity and politics in india and the vesh chakraborty's very wonderful book called habitation habitations of modernity which uh, takes on so as i've mentioned there is a kind of today in my entire talk today you you will see that um there's a presence of the western modernism and there's a presence of the sort of uh nationalist elite uh non western modernism of the kind of the tagores um uh, but the more radical when I mean, people have talked about the more radical non western modernism uh, modernity and modernisms and those kinds of perspectives come mainly from marxist and subaltern scholars uh, sorry scholars of subalternity um so chakraborty and kobiraj are very important um anyway we don't have time to go into that now um and um so maybe i would i would end with that but i would just add one more point um uh, because i'm not sure how i'm doing for time i think i'm a little I'm going a little beyond time um one of the things that i would just end with is that the very core idea uh that in modernism in western modernism the the presence of the colonized other is a sort of um is a sort of invisible you know so, so the ex modernist uh, so overall actually let, let's just sum it up this way overall um what can we talk about what can we say about western modernism therefore is western modernism uh, you know west modernist figures like wolf and uh, uh joyce and 
T.S. Eliot and all of these modernist figures that we know of, you know, E.M. Forster, uh, Joseph Conrad, are these modernists um, critical of empire or are they complicit in empire? So I guess the overall uh, kind of best answer to give to that is that modernists were ambivalent. So they were critical of empire. They were, um, and, and a lot of radicalism that, uh, that they expressed, that their works express and reflect came because came out of that uh, <coughs> criticism uh, and polit political radicalism that they had. But at the same time, uh, they were ambivalent to empire because many times in often in modernist works, um, the, the colonial other is there, but you know, very much on the fringes and sometimes not even on the fringes, the colonial, the absolutely other, you know, uh, not the European other, not sort of, you know, not the Germans, for instance, for the English uh, writer, but the absolutely uh, other, uh, which is the African or the Indian, uh, existed on the colonial margins, but also invisibly. So uh, in, what, what do I mean by invisibly? Invisibly because they, would, would, they wouldn't exist, the colonial other, colonized other actually, uh, would not exist in mainstream literature. It would exist in, for, for instance, adventure tales um, of the kind of Kipling and Ryder Haggard and Jules Verne, um, or it would exist as sort of something out there. So if you read Wolf's uh, works, for instance, there's always this idea of uh, you know, overseas colony. And because um, the overseas colony is elsewhere, what happens is the colonized other is uh, sort of obscured. It doesn't really figure into mainstream literature. But also what happens is because the colony in, for the modernists, one of the main problems was the colon, you know, a lot of their political economic life depended on the colonies, but the colonies were always elsewhere. And that is why um, this, this, uh, this invisibility, this, this uh, peripheral presence of modernism uh, of the, of, of the colony, of their own economic political cent you know, centers, um, in a way, uh, resulted in the in a sense of emptiness, in a sense of uh, void uh, that exists at the core. And this argument, as I'm, uh, as I mentioned, this is a this is an argument that comes from Frederick Jameson. Uh, I plan to go into detailed analysis of these works, but uh, we've run out of time. So the argument that I just said um, is an argument that was um, that was that is Frederick Jameson's argument in his eight, 1988 essay called Modernism and Imperialism. Anyway, I would end with that, and um, I I'm happy to answer. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Huh. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for this wonderful uh, talk on global modernism. It's true that modernists are ambivalent, and but I personally think that global modernism uh, right now has become a new wave of scholarship uh, on the modernist uh, engagements, especially with imperialism, yeah. Yeah. Uh, colonialism, globalization, and circulation of modernist texts uh, in the. Yeah. Metropolitan centers and the, in the periphery, yes. uh, thus, uh, yes. thus facilitating uh, cultural exchanges and yes. shaping thereby shaping modernism as a truly cosmopolitan uh, movement. Uh, I would yes. say, yes. And there is no doubt that uh, modernist studies is undergoing a translational turn uh, right now. Absolutely. And, yes. And, uh, and modernism, uh, I think that it it has opened up a the domain of creative expressivity uh, within. Uh, modernity is dynamic of uh, rapid change and translational here playing a major role i think it has a central role to play uh, in the multilingual globalization of uh, modernist uh, studies modernist text yes. I, I think right so uh, uh, we take questions and i'm just making it visible to your screen it's by onushri das yeah sure I, can I read it out? I am. I can see the question. So, yes. Okay, I'll read it out. Initially, modernism attempted to dismantle existing hierarchies, but later modernism itself was recognized as exclusive. 
uh, how, when, why the need of temporal, OK. Uh, so it, it, there's nothing initial or later about it. I mean, it's happening at the same time. Modernism as a movement, as even, as, even if we understand it as a Western movement, um, it attempted to dismantle existing hierarchies. And that's how it came into being. Um, uh, but you know, uh, it is as we, as criticism moves on, moves forward, and as we get more complex in our critical outlook, in our critical examination of modernism, um, from you know, from the angles of postmodernism, from critiques of say, and this is something that I want to talk about, but uh, we didn't have time. Uh, a major stream of major. Um, uh, street, uh, you know, strand of critical in criticism in global modernism uh, is uh, is critics are, are, are critics of um, uh, capitalist uh, modernism, so modernization. So, so global capitalism, for instance. So, so critics, for instance, of the Warwick Research Collective, they have come up with this book called "Combined and Uneven Development." So, the idea of Combined and une uneven development, um, basically, and Frederick Jameson is there in it. Um, Homi Baba talked about it. Um, so the ar argument here is that uh, capitalist, uh, global capitalism, and this this is why I mean, if we have to think of a later in the sort of understanding of modernism, then it is this that uh, that you know Raymond Re these these uh, cr critiques of modernism and em empire like Raymond Williams and Lukács and Jameson, they were of the opinion that, um, that the focus of empire, the focus of uh, the, the relationship between modernism and empire has shifted after the World War, after the Second World War. So pre-World War, uh, pre-Second World War, um, the focus was on inter-empires, so there was inter-relationship between empires, between the European empires. So imperial rivalry was more the focus there. Whereas after post, -war, uh, post after Second World War, the focus now shifts to the relationships imperial uh, of re uh, relationships of imperial dominance between the first, so the, the so the so-called first world and the third world. Now, what happens is that the, what what accounts for this shift is that modernism or the early twentieth century um, was a period of transition from sort of internationalism into or sort of you know uh, of a world of nation states into um, sort of capitalist internationalism, and this is very important. This is an this is an idea that comes mainly from the Marxist theorists, uh, but this is very important in understanding. the The core idea is that in 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 a world of capitalist, uh, uh, in a in a capitalist modern world, you know, world that is a global world, which is what we and the whole field of global modernism actually exists in that world, uh, which is today we live in a global world, uh, modernized by an internationally connected globalized by capitalism. The lo very logic of capitalism is that it, uh, it, it simultaneously, and this is what uh, uh, Mr. Kundu was talking about, uh, simultaneously promotes an idea of one, of oneness. So translation becomes this really important tool to promote this oneness uh, and cause this, which even the idea of global modernism is there because of this globalized, uh, capitalist structure. Um, but at the same time, this oneness only stands on profound inequality, the profound inequality that has to continue. There is no, uh, there is no end to, there is no, um, there's no, uh, you know, end point at which this inequality is going to go away. So this, this is, this is the combined and une uneven development. Too, okay. This is the idea of what I think the Marxist theorist uh, Ernst Bloch had first come up with. Uh, which was called um, Ernst Bloch had talked had, had called it simultaneous uncontemporaneity. So this kind of paradoxical uh, rephrasing is to express this idea of how the world today that we live in is necessarily one and profoundly unequal at the same time. So um, how how does that reflect in literature, for instance? How how are we? Uh, how do we change our attitude towards literature um, because of that? So it's a very interesting uh, observation by the Warwick Research Collective, where 
uh, these scholars say that we ought to, uh, we, we, we could, one of the things we could do is forget about literary periodization. So we don't have to look at literary periods like romanticism, modernism, postmodernism. Uh, we could look at literary, literary uh, lit literature as being constituted by waves of, um, in, you know, uh, by sort of these waves of capitalist modernization or phases of capitalist modernization. So literature as a constant dynamic interaction or production, uh, uh, the product of a constant dynamic interaction between the core and the periphery, instead of capitalist core and the periphery, instead of the sort of monolithic periodized um, structure. Anyway, so coming back to, so, you know, all of these, uh, whether it is it is a uh, it is um, this kind of a critique of capitalist modern uh, modernity, or whether it is a postmodernist or a poststructuralist critique, uh, it is it is this sort of a post understanding uh, of modernism that makes us look at uh, re-examine modernism as more exclusive. And also one of the things that I wanted to, I didn't mention in the uh, in the talk is that the way we understand modernism, this is the first thing about global modernism, the way we understand modernism is always, um, you know, from like, we, we understand modernism from the present. So it's always sort of a retrospective look at modernism. Like, you know, there is no, the modernists did themselves did not think of themselves as modernists. They, th they, th they thought of themselves as imagists and cubists and surrealists and futurists and so on. But they didn't think of themselves as modernists. So the, and this is what um, Raymond Williams calls the late born ideology of modernism. So the idea of mod modernism that we have today is something that is late born. Anyway. Um, uh, is there a next question? I think I saw a next question. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, from... um, Debo Broto Odikari. When you speak of the Western modernism, do you hint at some uniformity linearity as West is not a homogeneous job? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely right. There is so that that's one of the other caveats that I forgot to give in the beginning that you know, when we're thinking of Western modernism, there is no uh, so there is French modernism, there is Italian modernism, there's Spanish modernism, um, uh, and so on. So you're absolutely right. The West is not homogeneous at all. But there's an idea. Uh, the idea is, if you read Edward Said, for instance, the idea uh, that the construction of the West and the East, I mean, should we, so this is a debatable idea. Should we even have these categories of the West and the East is a debatable idea. My uh, my opinion there would be that, uh, you know, they are useful categories in order to understand imperial discourse for nothing else. So in order to understand how Western modernism, uh, Western modernists understood the colon colonized other, probably Western modernism is a uh, useful category, but it does not have to be a concrete category. Like we can use it as, as we need to. And uh, the works of Edward Said, as many of you know, he's, he has actually written a very important piece called A Note on Modernism in his book, Cultural, uh, Cultural, uh, Culture and Imperialism. Um, so Said was one of the main, um, actually the proto-global modernists, you know, he critiqued the, the modernists, Western modernists. And in, uh, in post-colonial theory, that's why in post-colonial studies and in Orientalist studies, you will find um, the categories of the West and the East uh, frequently used. In fact, several, several um, non-Western modernists also use that category very frequently. One of them I can think of right now is this Arabic modernist writer called Taib Sali, who, um, who argues that we have to use the concept of the West and the East because there is a no, so for Sali, for instance, there is no, uh, nothing called a harmonious relationship between the West and the East. The relationship between West and the East is always conflictual. So in order to understand that, we have to sometimes using the West as a category. But at, at the same time, just a, uh, another very short response to, final response to your question, um, you could look up the works of this global modernist scholar called Susan Stanford Friedman, who's written this book called Planetary Modernisms. And in the idea of planetary modernisms, the idea of planetarity uh, influenced, I, I would say, not influ yeah, kind of influenced, not entirely similar, but um, a little bit similar to Gayatri Spivak's idea of planetarity. Uh, Friedman uh, argues about exactly what you're saying, that there is a, you know, we do not have to use these 
she argues uh, she cla- she uh, her argument is that we don't have to use any of these categories west east orient occident uh, core periphery nothing for her modern the idea of the modern can be found in any period so for instance in 16th century india in 4th century uh, china anywhere and uh, uh, so there is a no concept so, so she sort of sort of anti institutionalizing of modernist studies there so as you're saying so that kind of approach exists in global modernist studies as well um yeah as i uh, don't find any more questions right now so uh, these are the few observations uh, good words okay. from mamun sir from okay. bangladesh thank you thank you <laughs> yes modernists are um oh thank you it's a privilege for me to uh, give a talk uh, to midnapur college i mean i grew up in suburban calcutta so i i'm very aware of the prominence and heritage of midnapur college so um so it is a real honor for to be invited to speak here uh thank you uh Enjoy. now we would uh, end the session with formal vote of thanks and for that i request our student shulakha baske to offer the vote of thanks to our rufus person today yes sir am i audible yes I, you are hi shulakha okay. good good evening ma'am good evening sir yes. and a very good evening to all the participants i shulakha baske student of ug6 sem on behalf of department of english midnapur college autonomous would like to thank our renowned speaker opula das university of toronto for enlightening us with her golden words on the topic global modernisms and introduction thank you so much ma'am for your enthralling lecture it's our privilege to have you with us thanks a lot ma'am thank you now I would like to convey my gratitude to our honorable principal sir Dr Gopal Chandra Bera for giving us the permission to the series through online my cordial thanks to our professor Tanmay Kundu sir for this initiative and making this pandemic a grand success by organizing this virtual lecture series for last two months i would like to thank all the participants not only from our college but also many other institutions that they have wasted their time in this lecture series and making it a grand success stay safe thank you